Okay, so we're back to our example on how to reconcile the balance shown on the bank statement against the balance shown in your cash ledger account. And notice that again, those two amounts are not the same. Beginning with the balance per bank statement, you will always add your deposit in transit and subtract out your outstanding checks. Okay, so I always recommend you start here first. We got this one has lesser transactions to get your adjusted or we call your true cash balance. Now for the cash balance per books, again, this is the cash amount shown in your cash ledger account. Any items that were recorded by the bank, but not by the company, such as electronic funds transferred, should be added. With the error, it depends upon the type of error. Whether it, it caused this amount to be overstated or uh, understated it would tell you whether it should be added or subtracted from the balance per your cash ledger account. Whenever you have a NSF check, any type of fees that were charged by the bank, you will always subtract those from the balance per book to get your adjusted cash balance. If these two amounts are not the same, your bank reconciliation is wrong and figure it out. You must figure out what items I need to add, subtract from each of these because once you're done, these two amounts must always equal one another. Okay? Now, any adjustments made to the balance per books requires you to make a journal entry that will then post it to the cash ledger account. And remember that as of right now, we're showing in our cash ledger 11,709.45. We're saying that amount should be 12,204.85. So it will be that amount after we journalize these adjustments and then post them to the cash ledger account. You ready? Let's go. So first, anything that we add to the balance per books, you would debit to your cash account. So with electronic funds transfer, that means a client that owed us money, paid us, but the fund was to make directly. So we're gonna increase our cash account, but decrease account receivable, okay? Then we have the error for the $36 which we, in our situation, we made the error. We actually had a check written for the wrong dollar amount. We required to pay for 1262. We only paid 1226. Meaning that the account's payable account is actually understated. So I'm gonna put the $36 debit to my cash account, credit account payable for the $36. The NSF check, meaning that a client wrote us a check, but that check did not clear, meaning that client still owes us money. Yes, they do. So we're going to put that back on the books by debit and account receivable at 425.60. And because the check didn't clear, decrease our cash account by 425.60. So in your bank rack, you already know that if you're gonna add it, you're going to debit the cash account. If a subtraction, you're going to credit your cash account. You must just figure out what other account is going to be involved in that business transaction. Two more. Then we have those fees charged by the bank for the credit card, debit card, bank service charge. Often we'll lump those together as a bank total expense. Sometimes women call it a miscellaneous expense. So debit the appropriate expense account, credit the cash account for the 150. Now, once I've done those journal entries, I'll then post those to my cash ledger account. Once they've been posted, now my cash account reflects its true cash balance at the end of the accounting period. So the purpose behind the bank rec is to determine what should be your true cash balance at the end of the accounting period, 
First, journalize any adjustments to be made to the balance per books only, and then post those to your cash ledger account. You got that? Okay. So you have a homework problem, problem 74A, I believe exercise 7-6, maybe another one, where you're going to have to do some reconciliation of the balance per bank statement against the balance shown in your cash ledger account, known as the balance per books. Next, terminology when it comes to reporting cash. Cash equivalents and restricted cash. Cash equivalent refers to any short-term highly liquid investments that are both rate convertible into cash and they're near their maturity that the market value is relatively not going to change. You're like, what? What does that mean? I'm glad you asked that question. This is simply saying that sometimes we have short-term investments that we expect them to mature in a time period of three months or less. It could be treasury bills, it could be stocks, it could be bonds, any type of short-term investment that we expect to mature within three months on the balance sheet, they go with a category known as cash equivalents. You're able to do that because we're going to convert them to cash so quickly, we feel that the interest rate on those investments is insensitive, meaning that they won't have that much of an effect on the balance of those accounts because once again, we're going to cash those in in a very short period of time. Restricted cash. This is cash that we set aside for a specific or a special purpose. Restricted, restricted cash is not shown in your cash account on the balance sheet. It is shown in a separate cash account or a separate account. We do that because if a person is reading our balance sheet, we want to know that this amount of cash is not available for general use. It has been set aside for a special purpose. One example, should I draw for you? I'm not going to draw, I'll just talk to you right now. Let's say that we plan on constructing a new building in five years. That building is going to cost us $10 million. So each year, we're going to set aside $2 million to pay for that building within five years. That $2 million will be shown in a separate account on the balance sheet known as restricted cash because those funds are set aside for a specific purpose, not for general use. Okay? So, for example, here is an ad partial balance sheet for Delta Airlines, and it has their cash and cash equivalents. It has their short-term investment, which means that these items, we do not intend to convert them into cash within three months, but within less than one year. And they also have restricted cash. Now, in their end report, they would give us additional information as to what item we plan to purchase or build or develop with this. So basically, they'll tell us what's the purpose of the restricted cash, that information you will find in the end report in the disclosure note. Okay, almost done. Managing and monitoring your cash. Basic principles of cash management. Increase the speed of receivables and collection of your cash. How do we do that? We may offer our customers discount, terms such as two slash 10, comma n slash 30. We would give them a discount if they pay us by a certain date in order to speed up our receivable. You see on skate? Speed, you got it? It's the general, okay. Next, keep inventory low. We now understand that buying in bulk is not the best way of doing things because of the cost of storing inventory. So if I keep my inventory low, try to keep enough to satisfy the needs of my customer, then I'm not spending excess cash on the inventory that they're just sitting in a warehouse. Monitor payment of your liabilities. 
desk is applicable in your personal life. Pay your bills on time, people. Okay? So we now understand that if we pay by the due date, that key also have to pay type of interest. It also is going to have an impact on your credit reporting because when you do pay late as a company or individual, that has a negative impact on your credit score. Plan timing of major expenditures. So if we again, if we plan to build, so here's my drawing, I drew this for you, you're welcome. If we plan to build a new facility in five years from now, we want to start saving money for that now. So we're going to put money set aside so that when it's time to make the actual purchase or the uh, building of this facility, we do have funds set in place. Invest your idle cash. See the money? Money just chilling, right? What does that mean? It means that from a company perspective, you want to have enough funds available to take care of our operational costs, but not too much money in a regular checking account because it's not earning us any interest. So I know you guys have a lot of money. So perhaps we're saying rather have all the money in a checking account, use those funds to maybe do some investments where you can get a higher return off of the use of the extra cash. Don't have the money just chilling. Have enough funds to take care of your bills. But if you have any excess funds, those funds can be used as a type of investment to get a higher return on the use of your cash. Okay. Last topic would be cash budgeting. Cash budgeting is another topic that once again can be applicable to your personal life. We're going to anticipate our cash flows, cash inflows or receipts, and our cash disbursement. So what we're saying here is that what companies do, we do, we do budgets all the time. We project the amount of cash coming in, the amount of cash going out. You do that to know whether we're going to have a cash shortfall. So for example, think about the amount of money you have coming in, let's say in the next six months. Think about your bills for the next six months. We're saying, do we have enough cash coming in to take care of all of our cash that's worth the next six months? If not, if you're going to have a shortfall, how do we plan to make up for that shortfall? Do we have the ability to, to borrow money? So you don't want to wait until it's time to pay the bill and say, oop, I'm short of cash. You want to plan for that, plan ahead so that we know that, okay, I'm going to be short by the end of month four. So let me put a plan together where I can have the cash available. It, it might mean finance, it might mean borrowing money so that I have the funds available to take care of that shortfall when it comes. So as a business standpoint, we do a cash budget to match our cash more effective. So th this way we'll know if we have idle cash, right? The idle funds can be used to invest to earn a, a high return. Or if we're going to have a shortfall, we have to figure out, do we have money in our savings already that we can pull from? Or what other funds do I have to take care of these shortfalls? So here's a sample of a cash budget. I'm not going to go through each of these items, but what you see is the beginning cash balance. It shows all the cash coming in and all the cash disbursements. And then it shows the amount of cash we're going to have available at the end of each of these quarters. Okay? So in this situation, this company wants to maintain a cash balance of at least $15,000. So what you notice that at the end of the second quarter, we will only have $12,000. Therefore, we know already we need to borrow $3,000 at the end of the second quarter in order to maintain an any cash balance, in this case, in the amount of $15,000. Go back. So what the cash budget does, it shows all of our cash inflows and our cash outflows, and if there's a need to borrow funds, to maintain a steady balance. Okay? So I as promised, that's it. That concludes our lecture over chapter seven. Now
Complete your Chapter 7 homework assignments. Bye-bye.